Again, uh, Alexander Shulgin, or Sasha Shulgin, as he's known to his many, many friends, a number growing all the time, certainly needs no introduction here in his home court in the Bay Area, but uh, I'd like to give him a little one anyway. Um, I, I remember some people have the expression, I think uh, the common expression is, run it up the flagpole and see if anybody salutes. Is that the way it's said? And so... Um, I, I have often used Sasha as a sounding board for ideas because he's he's able to more or less find problems with just about any theory you can come up with, no matter how well thought out or intricate. The more intricate, the more problems, of course. Um, so I say, you know, run it past Sasha and see how many holes you can poke in it. And uh, it's he's uh, uh, very good at that. He's really got an excellent analytical faculty, great sense of humor, and uh, we've been really fortunate to have him participate recently in our Botanical Preservation Corps events. And, of course, you all know about his publications, PCOL and then the long-awaited TCOL, which we're all eagerly hoping to see. And PCOL, of course, has really had a profound effect on what William Burroughs was fond of calling the narcotics industry on all levels, I think, as, as he put it, from the uh, bottom to the top, so to speak meaning uh, the narcotics industry writ large, including also the um, police complex. And so um, I asked Sasha for his talk, uh, the title for his talk this time, and so he very coyly came up with a very specific and, and uh, uh, detailed title, phenethylamines and tryptamines. And so once again, I'm as much in the dark as you are as to exactly uh, just what we're, we're about to hear. And so I'll let him tell you, Alexander Shulgin. I, I thank you very much. It's a great welcome. And it's a great pleasure to be here. And it's a great audience, and I've heard it laughing at the right time, which is a very great pleasure. <laughs> I was going to put together, uh, I was just asked a moment ago if I had any slides, and I was toying with the idea of putting together a small uh, set of 40, 50 slides. Um, I have a knack of using a term which I happen to enjoy called dirty pictures. These are benzene rings with chains on them and naphthol rings and indole rings and quinoline rings. And uh, I, I like throwing them around because it's easier, in a sense, to to use a, a symbol as a definition of a chemical or of a drug. And this this transformation that's necessary to look at a at a white crystalline material and say this is this is mescaline, or look at a picture, what I call a dirty picture, a ring with some methoxy groups on it and a chain and a nitrogen hanging out there somewhere. And say, this is the dirty picture of mescaline. This is what mescaline would look like if you get rid of the other 10 to the 25th things and have only one thing left and um, had a microscope that was big enough to see it. That would be the structure of it. And uh, people say, well, you don't get technical, don't get into chemistry. I mean, tell, tell me about mescaline. And my whole world has been, yes, telling about mescaline, but also telling about chemistry and trying to bridge, in a sense, what a thing is, what it looks like, long needles, white, sharp edges, certain angles known with great accuracy, and certain action in the body if it's absorbed and dissolved and goes into the correct areas, and yet a dirty picture that lets the chemist know what is attached to what at the atom level, the five balls in the bottom of the basket level that was talked about yesterday, uh, at that level, so that if you want to make something that is not quite mescaline, you know that you can, in a sense, pull that off and put that on, and you get a white, nice white crystal, different angles, different things, different solubilities, and very often different action in the body. So, in keeping with the marvelous uh, example that was given by Kerry yesterday, Harry Mullis, I threw out these hypothetical 52 slides, and I think I will do as he did, come off the wall, and just sort of talk about phenethylamines and tryptamines. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Actually, I have one more advantage over him. He had to leave Georgia and come to Berkeley to find a life 
Uh, I was born in Berkeley. I found a life there. <laughs> All right, we've had a lot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly in the face of what's gone on yesterday and what will undoubtedly continue and conclude tomorrow, in which everyone talks about a plants and plant teachers and plant entities and spirits and these magical things that they really are. And after all, the second half of the title of the, of the whole meeting is, is botany. So I guess that's quite appropriate. And indeed, uh, plants are often felt as being superior teachers. They're natural, um, and they uh, grow everywhere. They're available. Sometimes they're scarce. Uh, but we've heard a few things that give me some pause about the, the, some of the virtues that are, are, are always attributed to them. They're natural, yes, but they are natural. And how do you modify a plant away from nature? Well, you have to go into chemistry to do that. So. Uh, I heard, for example, a, a nice talk by Jace in which he talked about the composition of, of um, ayahuasca. And he said, I asked a number of these sort of things. At least it gives us a picture of how and what's in there and what does what. And I hear things like the DMT level in the various drinks of ayahuasca ranges from 12% to 0%. And the harmine level ranges from 30% to 50%. And sometimes there is a harmaline present and sometimes not. I'm wondering if not, uh, a, it's a, it's a variable teacher. I mean, how do you, you're learning that the teacher has different faces, and I don't know if you can really sometimes talk to the same teacher twice. Because you're getting different admixtures, you're getting different things added to what. It turns out we're not quite sure what the plant was that went in there. I was told it was such and such, but it re, really, we've named it so and so because it's not that, but it's something else. And, uh, there's an element of, of uncertainty that, uh, I feel is no, more than if you go into chemistry, but ne not necessarily less. Chemistry has its uncertainties, believe me. So in a sense, I believe that chemicals can also be very good teachers, as good teachers as plants. And uh, they also contain impurities. <laughs> um, they also contain impurities, and sometimes you know what they are, and sometimes you don't. You have the argument, for example, I hear it both ways, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, these little impurities that might occur as uh, side products in this alkaloid are the very things that give it color and give it personality and make it something special. Then the next sentence will be, these little purity impurities are there in such small amounts that they can't contribute significantly to the effect of the plant. So in essence, if you want to say this is different than that because of impurities, you got it made. You want to say this is the same as that in spite of the impurities, You've got it made. Well, we have impurities in organic chemicals too, believe me. And, uh, the, uh, you have the advantage of knowing what they are. You do have the somewhat of an advantage in that you probably have a better consistency in making a material in the laboratory, although believe me, I have had experiences in which that is not so. I made a sample of 2CE many, many years ago. And, uh, this, this, I'm getting ahead of the story, but I'm used to that. Um, a sample of 2CE, uh, which I got a beautiful white crystal solid, and it's a remarkable chemical. I wrote a, a better part of a chapter on that. And then I said, oh, about a few, maybe 10 years ago, I would like to make another sample of that, you know, and just to, you know, consistency, at least I can get more of it and explore it further if that were my want. And I made it, and I got the penultimate compound, beautiful orange crystalline, Solid, right melting point, right infrared, GCMS, right on the money. I reduced it, it reduced beautifully to a white crystalline solid, and it was not 2CE. It had the mass spec of 2CE, the infrared was totally different, and I could not interconvert the two. To this day, I don't know what went wrong. I mean, here's a good example of getting the wrong plant out of the wrong part of the wrong garden, getting the wrong chemical out of the right reaction in the wrong way. And so you cannot just assume because it's a discipline that has been worked into a technology that is so sophisticated that things can't go wrong. Believe me, they do, and they do with sad, sad regularity. Okay, now I'm going to get into hand. I, I, I was asked, do I want a chalkboard? Sure, I love chalkboards. But then I'm st stand at the chalkboard and I never wear a microphone, so I can't be heard. And also get in the habit, if I have five erasers at the chalkboard and one podium, five trips to the podium brings five erasers back to the podium and I have no eraser at the chalkboard. And the chalk is back here, so I end up coming back for the chalk, taking five erasers over, I spill them, and I, I just didn't do it here. So no, no slides, no chalkboard, I will use, I will use hand wavings. <laughs> I do it anyway. <laughs> Uh, if you could visualize, in a sense, away from the white crystal solid and into the chemical structure, a great big sort of fuzzy thing that was somewhat negative, I mean that in the sense if you put a positive thing of a magnet, it would go in that direction, 
uh, and it didn't have well-defined borders, but it was a big, what we call a ring. And then you had a separation in two units, certain distance, from a little tight thing that's very negative. The chemical name for it's a nitrogen atom. So if you had a big ring, fuzzy, and a carbon-carbon and a nitrogen atom, you have a system, a ring ethyl amine, that probably is the skeleton of 90%, 95%. I'm going to take a chance here and head for the P word rather than the E word. Uh, there's 95% of all the psychedelics have that as a, as, a, uh, as a skeleton of their chemical structure. So the whole question comes in, what is a big fuzzy ring and what does it look like? Uh, can you vary the this, this separation? And what is this little sharp nitrogen like and what can you do to it? In a very general sense, I'm, not, I'm talking about 95% of all these, of all these, of these drugs. The big ring over here is usually either a benzene ring or an indole ring. That's it. There you get into all kinds of other things. They've made oxygen over there, sulfur's over there, they've made two carbon systems over there, they've put two nitrogens in, the nitrogen to each of the two, no good. It's either a benzene ring or an indole ring. There are exceptions, of course, but this is basically it. Two carbons. No, one carbon, you get something that's usually a very funny and a, a peculiar out-of-body nice thing. Some people love out-of-body stuff. I don't care for it. When I want to go to the bathroom, I want to know it's me who wants to go to the bathroom <laughs> and make it there. Uh, uh, I guess each person has his own, his own pace and stride. But I kind of like... <laughs> that didn't sound right either. Uh, I kind of like uh, being where I know I am, and I, I, I love getting into visual and physical, physio, uh, well, not physiological, uh, visible uh, imagery, interpretive, erotic occasionally, but not so much, you know, when you get old, uh, can place. But the idea of somehow going out on the astral plane and getting away from there and seeing what the universe is really like from out there, looking back at this poor guy who's lying on a bed somewhere with a full bladder, and it's not his concern. Ah, no. <laughs> Uh, that I can say, that that's not that's not not my not my pace. Uh, so I guess I, I'm I'm kind of the old 19th century classic uh, psychedelic chemist, in that the idea of visual, tactile, auditory, all these things are extraordinary, and from these I always see the things as being the the instructive, the informative, the rewarding aspects of it. And I do not personally, I have been out there, do not personally see the reward of having a cosmic picture of something that I'm not quite sure if it, if it applies to me. Okay, the personal. So, uh, I first got in this area, let me give you a little picture. We have this benzene, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, called a phenethylamine. You have indole, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, called a tryptamine. You have a third family that is both an indole, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, and a benzene, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, in the same molecule, usually called an ergoline. And these are basically the three classes of psychedelics. You can take this benzene ring, it's a, it's a fuzzy, almost nice, a negative thing, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, and bang it back onto itself with one more carbon atom, maybe two, whatever it is down there. It's called a tetrahydroisoquinoline, big name, forget it. There are almost none of them known to be psychedelics. You can... <laughs> But no, though it's important, almost all the alkaloids in cacti are those tetrahydroisoquinolins. And they haven't been tasted. I didn't say they weren't psychedelics. I just said they weren't known to be psychedelics. So there's a lot of territory yet to go. Okay, take great big fuzzy aromatic ring system called indole and hook it carbon-carbon to the nitrogen giving you the tryptamine and take that nitrogen and hook it back onto the indole with a carbon atom in there. You have what's called a beta-carboline. Now, here they are some active compounds, and I want to talk about those. And then, as I say, when you have both of them the same molecule, you have the LSD-type uh, lysergide family. So that is kind of a hand-waving start. My interest in this area became precipitated very abruptly in the mid-1950s, and much in the same way that uh, Peter's was with, with the mescaline peyote world. And I was exposed to a 400 milligram uh, opportunity with uh, uh, mescaline sulfate. Interestingly, my now co-worker, partner, mate, wife, Anne, at almost the same time, her first exposure was to peyote. And uh, it happened to be that our, one of the sort of viewers, uh, uh, inspector, watchers over me, happened to be the same person that was a watcher over her. 
And we did not know this for another 15 or 20 years. We didn't know each other. We didn't know the one, the one, each knew the person, but didn't know the other person knew the person. And there was no, no awareness of one another for what, mid 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 40 some odd years and have been married for 20s, maybe for 20 years, didn't know this. So my first experience was mescaline, I don't know, 1952, 53, 54, somewhere in there. And, uh, it was a, an experience that completely caught my attention, completely changed my attitude toward who I was and what I did. And, uh, I, I think I have talked about it before. I won't get into it too much now. But the, the, the heart of it was, I realized that there was an immense amount in me, uh, available to me that I couldn't have access to normally. And I suddenly realized the fatuousness of people saying that mescaline taught me this, and I, I think the same in a funny way applies to plants, that the plants taught me this. What it is, you use the plant, you use the compound as a facilitator, as a catalyst to see within yourself what's there. And I think this is the heart of the psychedelic drug. <laughs> so go back to 1950, whenever it was, and at this point I wanted to take and cast a picture at that time. We were just getting out of Truman in the World War II, and uh, I just had gotten out of college and into some graduate school somewhere. And I got exposed to this mescaline thing. What was known at that time in the area, God, it wasn't even called, I think they used the other words, it wasn't called even P words at the time. They had H words and other things back there. Hallucinogenics, they had psychotomimetics, they had delusional things, but no one, the, society, the term psychedelic was not created for another, another 10 years. What was known there? In the phenethylamines, there was mescaline, it had been worked out in Germany, the, the compound had been isolated and structured, de, not, not, structure not determined. It had been isolated in the 1890s, Hefter, and it was first synthesized, I believe, by Spett about, nine, eight, not, about 1920 or so. It was a German origin. There was NN dimethyl mescaline was known. I believe it's called tricocerine. It worked out by a Frenchman who had assayed it in the sense that he had tasted it up to 750 milligrams and got nothing out of it. And that was a known, not active material. MDA was known. It worked out by Gordon Allis, an American. It worked in UCLA as a pharmacologist at UCLA who reported and had synthesized and converted over to Smith, Klein and French. Smith, Klein and French, I guess, was the name of the company then, uh, as a possible appetite thing or a stimulant thing, but it's something of central activity. And one report in Canada of TMA, trimethoxyamphetamine, which is mescaline, this thing, ding, ding, bong, that thing, with one more appendix hanging down over here. It's called a methyl group. So it's really a three-carbon chain, but still, the separation between this and this is two carbons. Uh, that's Canadian. In the area of the tryptamines, what was known had DMT, had been identified finally as a plant source, although it was synthetic much, much, much earlier, synthesized by uh, Mansky in uh, Canada again, uh, gosh, in the 30s, I believe. But it was known as a plant component, and a person by the name of Steve Zara, with whom I've had a marvelous relationship for about 40 years, uh, had synthesized the N-dihomoethyl, the propyls, the butyls, the amyls, the pyrolidyls, the morpholyls, the piperidyls, whatever it is, a host of these things with, with, I'm, I'm, uh, the big thing small, okay, uh, the big things over, the small one, the nitrogen over here has its things, I, I'm right-handed and I, the, I, I'm doing this mirror image to you, uh, the big thing I usually draw, on this side of the blackboard and the nitrogen over here. And the, his variations is on the nitrogen. And 5-methoxy-DMT, which has recently become quite uh, well known for a number of reasons, not uh, the least being the fact that the toad, the dry toad down in Sonora Desert, as opposed to the wet toad that is now in Australia, as elsewhere, has it as, in its um, uh, gland secretions. Uh, Bufotenine is known, something that which I am still collecting a remarkable collection of of um, reports that is extremely active or it's not active at all. And psilocybin, psilocin would be tryptamines and they are the components that have been mentioned frequently in the mushroom area. Carbolines, harmine was known, harmaline is known, tetrahydroharmine was known, and a couple of synthetic things that were not explored, but the other than the basic three H, those H compounds there, harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine, that was about the extent of knowledge of the chemistry of the, of the, of the beta carboline. And in the ergot world, LSD was known, and about 10 synthetic variations of LSD. Again, here are the nitrogens up here. 
uh, amide with, instead of diethyl amide, LSD, lysergic acid, diethyl amide, dimethyl, methyl ethyl, uh, H2, uh, again, morpholine, pyrrolidine, all kinds of things, all of them less active. So, and also at that time, there was some, uh, recognition of the, of the botanical origins of the, of the Oluluyuki that was mentioned in the Morning Glory Seeds. And so this was again in the Ergoline area. This is what was known. So this is where I started. And I said, you know, gosh, if, if a little bit of mescaline can change my attitude toward myself and be uh, make me quite so so dramatically aware of what, how beautiful things are and how clever I am and how intelligent I could be if I could only devote myself to something. Let's devote myself to something. So let's start making some new compounds. So I immediately went and got this Canadian argument of the TMA, the uh, trimethoxyamphetamine, the tri... The, the, you have a benzene ring out here, this fuzzy ring, is a benzene ring, it's attached this way, it's a bing bing, it's a hexagon, and it has a methoxy there, methoxy there, methoxy there. That's a tri, three, four, five, trimethoxy, benzene, carbon, carbon, NH2. What they report in Canada was trimethoxy, benzene, carbon, carbon, carbon hanging down, the appendix, the methyl group, the thing that makes it an amphetamine-like chain, NH2. So I had remember my, one of my last points in my first mescaline experience was coming back to the home, my home it lived in Berkeley at the time. Everyone lives at Berkeley about this time in life. Uh, and I had uh, on, the, on, the, on the coffee table in front of the couch a fantastic rose. And I somehow went into that rose. I went to that rose with such completeness. I learned that it indeed was the embodiment of many levels of colors. I had never seen colors as I saw in that experience, and that rose was symbolic of it. I mean, purple's purple, sure. I saw purples up against other colors, and it got up against other colors. The purples became lavenders, became violets, became little changes that don't, don't have names. And totally, totally seduced by it. I must have looked in that flower for half an hour. About three or four or five weeks later, I actually made, duplicated the, the Canadian synthesis, made trimethoxyamphetamine, said, all, are all these things really that similar? I took that, I had a little nausea going in, that's very proper. And I took somewhat less of the material because I gathered from the Canadian reports that it was somewhat more potent. And uh, so I, I did get a very interesting experience. And amongst other things, my late wife then had had another rose on that table. And in the course of it, I looked at that at rose with an extraordinary analytical indifference. I looked at it, the colors were there, they weren't as dramatic as mescaline. I took it in my hand, I looked at it, and I tore it apart to look inside. Totally shocking different attitude. I said, whoops, what is this in me that can dismember a thing to see what makes it work, as opposed to appreciate it as a working entity? And so I realized, hey, ooh, there's something else inside of me that maybe is not, maybe I'm not the, the, the perfect person I thought I was. You know, there's something in there that I, something to be learned from. Well, okay, now you got that. I, I, I published a note in Nature or Science or somewhere, Nature, I guess it was, indicating, because we had about three or four more of my friends who explored this, and each of them had some aspect of aggression. One of them got it to uh, a, mo a thing on the radio, uh, it was slaughter on Fifth Avenue or Tenth Avenue or something? A, 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 a very, very dramatic and a very um, piercing piece of music. And he got quite aggressive. You know, we had a lot of talk to talk him down. With mescaline, this is almost unthinkable. He had one carbon atom. It's a little appendix. This thing hanging down here. Not only changed the potency a little bit, but it changed the character of this thing quite dramatically. So, you know, good attitude. If one carbon changes this way, it's put two, three, four, five, six, eight. And I just synth went in the laboratory with a great gusto and I synthesized a variety of appendical appendages hanging down from this, this particular alpha carbon. And of course, alpha ethyl was, was the alpha TMA, alpha. I made the, God, I made the propyl, the butyl, the amyl, the hexyl. I couldn't find the right nitrocene for the seven. I made the octyl. By the time I had the octyl made, I had actually explored the four carbon thing, the methyl group hanging down, had no activity. None at all. I got up to about, about 500 milligrams. Nothing. Didn't want to go any higher. Just didn't feel right. So all of a sudden, I got the lesson that, you know, if three is better than two, one is better than none. Three, is, if it's not been two, I had this whole host of beautiful compounds, gorgeous white crystals. None of them, I assumed, would be active. Okay. So it didn't work. So what do you do now? Well, the next move I said, you know, the Teutonic mindset. Uh, here's this big, big fuzzy ring over here. I have a three, four, five. How many ways can you put three different methoxy groups onto this fuzzy ring? Well, you can go three, four, five, two, three, four, two, three, five, two, three, six, two, four, six, three, four, five, six. 
different ways. Make all six of them. Well, it's easy on a blackboard. You take an eraser and erase off methoxy here and write a methoxy on down there. In the laboratory, it takes a bit more time. <laughs> Um, especially uh, uh, one if those who are chemically inclined think about two, three, five for a moment. It's a virtually unknown ring orientation. Uh, it is now known. I figured a way of making it and I got into this thing. So I synthesized all these other five positional isomers. And I said, well, <laughs> how do you determine which is best? Well, at that time they're getting very red hot about uh, Siamese fighting fish, what's called beta splendens, splendens or something like that, where fighting fish would sort of put their tail up or float to the bottom of the tank, or do something weird with, with, with uh, psychedelics. And spiders, oh, they love spiders spinning webs that were funny. And they, this funny web was evidence of a psychedelic action of the compound, so people had these big spider cages with spiders doing. And I actually, this is the beginning of my first disillusionment in trying to find an animal model for something that is exquisitely a human type of action. So I played there, I did some other work later on, I occasionally, I'm sad to say, would kill a dog and often would kill mice. The dog was a cardiac dog, and I didn't know him well. But I got to know the mice, and I, I hated running LD50s because 50 of the animals survive, but 50 are dead. And what do you do with a dead mouse? I mean, you're, it's, you don't haven't learned anything. All you know is that this much compound killed a mouse. And so at least the live mice were turned loose in the field, and they fed something natural, uh, the ones that survived. And I gave up on mice, so I have not used a mouse or, or a dog now probably about uh, 35 years. Why? Well, uh, the human was a test animal, and I was a test animal, and I tried them on myself, and they, I, would, I would get answers, and uh, sometimes my friends would confirm them, and sometimes they wouldn't. That's fine. Uh, but uh, I had a very definitely strong uh, ethic that uh, if I was going to ever give it to anyone else or talk about it or other people would use it, I would try it myself and learn exactly what it did to me. And I would at least have that one aspect of an LD, hopefully zero, uh, value to, <laughs> to build on. So I made these five other isomers with methoxies, and of all the orientations, the two, four, five, and the two, four, six were the only ones that were really active, and they were both very active. So, gosh, you know, the 3, 4, 5 nature, nature made the 3, 4, 5 mescaline. Why did it choose to make the one that was about the least active of the possible ones? So this got me into a little start, a thought process. Does nature make alkaloids for people's benefit in plants? Or are the plants made for plants' benefits? Or are they defensive? Why do, why do these plants make alkaloids at all? I still, I, people ask me every now and then, you know, tell me, why do plants make alkaloids? Yeah. <laughs> I had that. Maybe it's a garbage can for unwanted nitrogen. Ah, nonsense. Dump it if you don't want it. Uh, maybe it's to, to attract insects that make pheromones that make armpit attractions to other insects so they can mount and do their thing. No. Uh, maybe you can find an example, but generally I have no idea why the world of plants produces alkaloids. They're gorgeous compounds. Some of the most complex rascals you can even imagine are in there, and you find them only as a rule because you either run a crystal test on it and you find an alkaloid positive color test, but more apt you find the, if a dead animal under the plant and he's been eating the leaf and you find there's a poison there. And so there is this action. You often pursue these compounds, act, uh, isolations and identifications on the basis of the fact there's something that goes on there and usually goes on not to a plant but to an animal. And you have this balance, and I found this again and again in nature, uh, the plant does what the animal needs. The animal does what the plant needs. The plant pees out CO2 and takes in whatever it is. Uh, anim uh, animals pee out. No, it's the other way about. An plants take in CO2 and out goes oxygen. People take in oxygen, take out CO2. Beautiful balance. If you find something that is 2,4 in a plant, you'll find it's 3,4 in animals. If you find something like your carbolines from the methoxy dangling down which hand? Down, down here on the carboline in the plant, it's out here in the carboline in the animal. It's almost as if the two kingdoms were balanced in some, uh, some clever way. And sometimes you get insight of what's going to be active in a person uh, by the basis of what, where the plant did it and do it the other way. So, yes, plants can be teachers, but sometimes in a very oblique manner in which that which is taught is taught by omission or is taught by change and not taught to be duplicated or to be imitated. So what I did, I did as I say, I put these other things. I had the 245 out there and the 246. Uh, along the same uh, general time, I tried 
Less methoxy groups didn't work. I tried more methoxy groups. It did not, it worked, but not as well. So roughly three oxygens, two or three oxygens was kind of the best out there. Then I said, well, gee, if you have all these methoxy groups, uh, what about making longer, make an eth ethoxy uh, there, or an ethoxy? I said, two, four, five. We're going to work at two, four, five. It's easy to make, straightforward, as potent as they come, the two, four, six is about equivalent. So instead of two, uh, uh, two, four, Instead of two, four, or five trimethoxy, I put an ethoxy on that. I made monoethoxy, dimethoxy. There's three of those. I made diethoxy, monoethoxy. There's three of those. I made trimethoxy. So I made seven more compounds. Ethoxy is the place of methoxy. Here, 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 or all. Uh, you know, another couple weeks' work. And <laughs> a couple months' work, a few months' work. And tasted them. And the only ones that were as or more active were the ones where the four was the four ethoxy. The others were down in activity. So that four had something, and I found the four and its magic will be the nitrogen and its magic in the, in the tryptamines and will be the nitrogen at the five position of the ergot family and its magic in the LSD type compounds. The other parts of the molecule, okay, go along with the ride, or become a little less active, or become inactive, but there is a spot in which magic occurs in each of these three families, and that's the spot, you can only find it by experimental trial and error, that's the spot in which you, you express your, your imagination. In the case of the phenethylamines, it was a four position. So, what great things, I put a, a chloro there, I put a nitro group there, I put a bromo group there, I put an iodo group there, anything I could put out there was fine. But the first thing that occurred to me, if a methoxy in that position, which gave me uh, TMA2, active at about 20 milligrams, that was one of my stumble compounds, I uh, had made uh, something like 8 or 10 milligram trial and had nothing, or, or it was 8 milligrams, so I went to 15 milligrams, and my arrogant confidence that I knew what was going on. It, it couldn't be active until it got up to there, you know, somewhere. So I was down here. So after an hour, I doubled the dosage, and I think it took a 24 or something milligrams. I discovered that 12 would have been quite adequate if I had waited another five or ten minutes. <laughs> and I spent the day in a, in a laundry room watching a washing machine that was not going around go around. It was a... <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I, I learned a great deal about being humble in, in extrapolating from one structure to another. That was a very instructive. Anyway, what I did, I said, here is an oxygen out here. Without doubt, this thing metabolizes by the methyl group being taken. That's the active position. The methyl group is off. I get a phenol. The phenol conjugates to something rather than gets excreted. That's how it gets metabolized. What if I were to put the methyl... I'm back here. Yeah. What if I were to put the methyl... I'm sorry, I've not drawn a blackboard from behind the blackboard before. This is This is... It's interesting. Here, I'm standing behind the blackboard, and I, here's the ring, and here's the chain, and here's the nitrogen. Okay. What if I were to take the oxygen out, nice, you know, wipe it out with, with, with an eraser, and put the methyl group right on the ring? Interesting. If the compound gets into whatever the receptor site, at uh, that time I still had some sort of a, a naive uh, belief that there's something to do with receptor sites and the action of these drugs. I have gotten rid of that finally. Uh, what, if, you, if, if this thing could get in at that time, receptor site, and this point of metabolism was, was very necessary, and this, this thing couldn't be metabolized, that son of a gun would be a very potent compound because it couldn't get rid of it. On the other hand, if it get in the receptor site and block the receptor site and it was not an active compound, then it would block whatever in the body makes you schizzy. Getting from getting in the receptor site and be the perfect prophylactic. So either it's going to be a very potent compound or it's going to be a very good defense against the body's natural tendency to go wonko with too much of this chemical, whatever it is. We'll identify the chemical by identifying the receptor site, by modifying this thing that goes into the receptor site in a way that it either is accepted or it's metabolized and gets out of there. You couldn't lose. Beautiful thing. I like this kind of experiments. So this was instead of 2,5-dimethoxy for methoxy, it was 2,5-dimethoxy for methyl. And since it uh, uh, took the oxygen out and put the methyl on, I called it DOM just to give it a, a set of initials. And it turned out to be an active compound, quite active. In fact, it was, a, it was on the top of my list for potencies for, for a couple, three years. And that was the one, that was my, one of my transition compounds in that it was the, um, I, about this time I had, I had left Dow Chemical Company for with mutually agreeable separation. Uh, that in itself was a story. I, I worked for them for 10 years. No, I worked for them for five years. I was employed by them for 10 years. That, that's a better way of putting it. <laughs> the first five years, I truly worked for them. 
and uh, I invented the, an insecticide that was the one the first biodegradable ones. They were happy on that, and I was working something else. And their feeling was, since you can invent insecticide by theory, and I invented because I they had something that was close to physostigmine. That's another story entirely. If that is indeed what you can do, why don't you use that same inventive thing and create something that you're interested in? I said, fine. So that was five years of free chemical laboratory space for working on psychedelic drugs. And uh, I got about a, a dozen patents out of it, uh, and Dow still has a dozen patents on psychedelics with no knowledge of what to do with them. Uh, but I got, I got a dollar for each of them, and that was, very, that was the standard of the industry at the time. Um, so at that point, I had left, left Dow and I'd gone into, into med school over in San Francisco. And this is about the time people were wandering up and down the hate thing, holding hands and having summers of love. And I was walking down the, the hate street, memorizing the circles of Woolets while people come toward me were stoned on something called STP. And I had no idea what it was. And it turned out STP, which was initially the uh, serenity, tranquility, and placidity, and placidity being an unpronounceable and undefinable thing, it became serenity, tranquility, and peace. Then it became uh, stop the police, and then, from the police point of view, it became too stupid to puke. And in any event, it was called STP. The first thing, this is my, this was my DOM compound. I didn't know it. Because it was somehow introduced on the street. And my level of, uh, I call it active compound, four or five, six milligrams is quite adequate. It lasts for about 18, 24 hours. Uh, but at that time, it was being put out on 20 milligram tablets. But its effects don't come on for an hour. And people would take the tablet and say, there's nothing there, and take a second tablet. So people were coming into the Haight-Ashbury Clinic with 40 milligrams on board on something that 5 milligrams is quite adequate, and there were some very, very difficult times. And I was innocently doing what you do up in the, up in the Parnassus Avenue there, and I was unaware for until about six months later that the materials, STP, was the DOM compound that I had had. And that, I had big, big supply of Dow, but that was intact. I don't know where it came from. But there it was. Anyway, so this was the direction that went. An interesting thing happened about that time. I was thinking about, I went back to my old appendix, one carbon, two carbon thing. I said, since this compound was totally different type of activity, long lived and different style, maybe it has other actions. So I put an ethyl group on it. And, what's my, I go to 10, I go to 1030? Yeah, okay. Um, so I put an ethyl group on that. And I said, this is not, probably not going to be a psychedelic, but it may be centrally active. And uh, I've tried it. I was working quite closely with Claudio Naranjo, who was down in Chile at that time, and he put it into about a dozen of his rather agitated and depressed patients, and all of them undepressed. And so we had what could very well be an antidepressant here, before really antidepressants were much in popularity. And Bristol, I happened to be uh, talking to Bristol. I gave a talk at a, at a Gordon Research Conference, and the head of research of Bristol was the secretary there, and I gave this talk. He said, why don't you give some to us to Bristol? We'll try it out. We'll see on our animals what it does. And uh, so I gave him a, a supply of this. I had called it Ariadne, just because I was in that kind of a mood. And I uh, gave, gave him a sample, Bristol, and they finally found an animal test in which it showed an action that they could define as being antidepressant. I think it caused monkeys to run mazes more readily or something. And then they also kept finding, they wanted to prove it was not hallucinogenic. And they found that, I think it was either DOM or mescaline, made a cat's tail go up like this and get all fuzzy. They called it a Halloween cat's tail. <laughs> And uh, this compound did not make the ha cat's tail go up and go fuzzy. So they used that to the FDA as evidence that it was not a hallucinogen, which I think... Uh, and uh, the FDA said, okay, sounds good to us. And they gave a... Gave a things were different in those days. Uh, gave a uh, IND, it's called an IND to Bristol to try it in human clinical studies. And the Bristol promptly did so. Uh, but that was a null aside. That was an interesting thing. But Bristol, I was not interested in antidepressants. I was interested in things that would would serve as exposures to the, to the of the human mind to itself. And so I went. I continued with my own my own work. And I mentioned that. But where the methyl was, chlorines, bromines, iodines. Uh, then I got the idea to go back to the. This is all these were with this little methyl group hanging down. Got rid of the methyl group. Go back to the phenethylamines themselves. And I went through a lot of these things. I tried uh, that two carbon system and the one that really has. Uh, now has achieved a fair amount of notoriety is putting the bromo group in that four position with a two carbon chain. It's a thing called, uh, 2CB and it got quite popular in Europe and then in this country and became illegal, which is a pattern that I have seen occur before. Uh, anyway, another one in the same area was exploring with methyl groups on the nitrogen. This is out of this part of the nitrogen. The dimethyl I mentioned very early, trichosterine, was not active. 
I put methyl groups on a host of other psychedelics. All cases, the activity dropped away and the compounds became quite different and quite uninteresting. The one exception was that one of the compounds that was known at that time that I first got into this area in the 50s was MDA and putting a methyl group on there produced a compound called MDMA and it was quite different but it was not a, a disappointment. And that, of course, is another story of another time. <laughs> Okay, the phenethylamines are still alive and going. Uh, there are lots of things that can be done. That four position, that four position is still a magic, magic place. I've, I've put one thing I'm really, it's a marvelous thing. I'd love to have time to do it, but I'm into tryptamines and other things now, but I'll get back to it someday. Is, uh, using the Teflon argument. If you, for example, you say, well, I'll put something that's very polar out there, a nitro group or maybe an alcohol or an acid or something. And if it gets into this so-called receptor site and where that thing dangles, it's attracted to something that wants a polar thing, it'll go this way. If you put in a very negative, lipophilic, fat-loving thing like, a, like an alkyl cho, it'll be repelled. It'll go that way and go down that way. If you put something like Teflon in there, Teflon is neither likes water nor does it like fat. It doesn't like anything. So suddenly you're putting something into that receptor site that it's not going to go up or go down. It's just going to get in the way of something and not be attracted at all. So I put a trifluoromethyl group out there. That's trifluoromethyl is a one-carbon Teflon. And the damn thing is not only is it interesting, it's the most potent phenethylamine yet made. The thing is active at not much over a milligram, and the amphetamine is active at less than a milligram. Fantastic. So what about putting a tripentafluoroethyl, put out a heptafluoropropyl. Let's put out bigger and bigger Teflons out there. What's going to happen? I don't know. This is exactly what I love about chemistry. I have no idea. <laughs> Every time you turn around, you get a question that suddenly, and if you're honest with yourself, I have no idea what's going to happen. It could be extremely potent. It could be extremely selective. It could be extremely damaging. It could be extraordinarily effective in, as a tool in this way, or it could fry a neuron. You don't know. And, and you won't know until you make the compound a little bit salty, but it crunches between the teeth, but it's okay. Try it. See how it feels. Record what goes on. Settle back for a couple, three days and gather your notes and see, is it worth going on? Is it a lead that's worthwhile? Does it make sense? Can you use the information anyway in the human study of the human mind? Can you use the information in any way in designing other tools that might be effective in the human mind? Okay, I'm going to go back to the second of these. This is the, the ring out here that's an indole carbon, carbon, nitrogen, tryptamine. Uh, tryptamines, as I mentioned, Sarah had made a host of these things, all alkyl groups. It turns out on the, on the aromatic ring, nothing, a four oxygen, a five oxygen, and that's it. There's no variety out there at all. You can have a five methoxy, that, this is the five methoxy DMT world, five hydroxy, the bufotenine world, four hydroxy, the psilocybin silicin world, no hydroxy, no oxygen, this is just the plain tryptamine world. On this chain, a little bit of play can be had. Again, a one-carbon dingler or a no-carbon dingler, two-carbon or two-carbon with one hanging. But the nitrogen is the area where all the, the versatility, the flexibility, the excitement can occur. So I, I said, why not? Let's make a whole bunch of these different things out in the nitrogen, which I did. And you get into things. One of the most remarkable things, again, uh, trip me, I, Sarah made the diethyl, dipropyl, dibutyl, diamyl, the pyrrolidyl, the piperidyl, and the morphyl. Don't take notes. There'll be no quiz in this. Uh, the morphyl. Okay. So I said, what about making uh, some other kinds of groups out there? So I made a diisopropyl group. And there's a diisopropyl? No. Di yeah, that's right. Diisopropyl. So now you have NN diisopropyl tryptamine or NN or just DIPT. And this was a most unusual compound. It, it, it had an action that I have not seen anywhere else and not found in any other compound. And that is, I, I have had 40 milligrams. I'm not getting any effect, you know, 10, 20 usual scaling up, 40 milligrams, and I was pounding through the house getting a cup of coffee. And uh, Hoosie's uh, Young People's Guide to the Symphony was on the, on the radio. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. I mean, and musically it's good, not the way it's being performed. So, you know, who, who, who let the amateurs at San Jose or wherever it was record this and play it on a major news, news uh, radio music station. I listened through it. Everything was out of tune. The timpani even was out of tune. The fiddles were out of tune. They even played these large musical string chords. They were out of tune. And it turned out that the ear, somewhere in there, was taking in the information. It was getting to the back of the head. 
going whatever association goes on there out to the, wherever the sides are interpreted. And somewhere along that line, things are getting screwed up. This ear was the same as that ear. So it probably wasn't an ear damage. And it, the music was going in, but it was, it was not like you're putting your finger on the side of a record and slowing everything down. It was that you were distorting the harmonic integrity of what you're hearing. Wow. Oh, subsequently, this, 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 uh, an auditory, so no visuals. No interpretive things, no colors, strictly auditory screw up. And so, on this, on this basis, it has been now tried by a person unnamed with two people, both with perfect pitch. Uh, one was with a striking instrument, I think it was a harpsichord. The other was with a sine wave generator, which takes all weird harmonics out of the picture. And the person would take, on separate occasions, each of these two people, and before, check this note, check that note, E above middle C, B flat, uh, notes, and what the note really was and what the note was said to be was a measure of the accuracy of the thing. Beautiful bass line. Dig, 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 dig. Then about 30 minutes into the, into the thing, the error grew, grew very badly this way, and then it began closing off again, and pretty soon became no error again. So for the first time, A, you had a quasi objective measure of the time course and the qualitative nature course of a, of a psychedelic, not a psychedelic, what is it? It's a, it's an auditory distortant. But a beautiful thing, almost, almost objective, because obviously the person had no idea what the note really was. He said what the note sounded like to him, and he said so. Both people had the same distortion, same time course at 40 milligrams. Subsequently, no, one was a 40 milligrams, one was a hundred milligrams. No, no visual. So I have taken that as a lead. I make the isopropyl, make the ethyl isopropyl, make the propyl isopropyl, make the propyl. I got a lot of interesting new chemistry coming out of it. You know, all things close, things that had the same shrubbery mass.